Wow. Back again. Wow. Say he's back. What's up, Cross Players? Nikki James here with the very first and only episode 15 of the Crossplay Podcast. We are back. Now, if you haven't heard our most recent YouTube videos where we're kind of giving updates on what's been going on in, in my life and stuff like that, go back and watch those now. Uh, the the short of it is, is you know, we had a move, you know, some life shakeup, and there wasn't really a lot of room uh, to do a lot of podcasting. So I kind of restructured, reformatted, and, and we're back. Uh, I want to take some time before I get started to go ahead and plug our brand new wrestling focused YouTube channel called Stiff Receipt. You can find that. I'll put the link in the description. You could just look up Stiff Receipt, uh, the channel on YouTube and find us there. Uh, let's get everyone that's subscribed here subscribed over there. I just didn't want to have, uh, you know, wrestling stuff on the YouTube or on the crossplay channel for people that weren't into the wrestling thing. It's kind of uh, spreading our vision a little thin. So go ahead and watch that video if you want an update on that. Let's get right into it today. Uh, so what have I uh, been playing lately? Um, you know, we usually start the show with this. What have I been playing? I'm playing a lot of Magic the Gathering. Uh, I kind of went back on the, I mean, God bless backwards compatibility on the Xbox One wow. uh, because now I can go back and play all my old Magic the Gathering games. I've never been a big fan of the Magic game that's on the Xbox One Magic Duels, that uh, free-to-play version. I don't know. I just, I have such an aversion to free-to-play games that I just, you know, I, I played it a little bit, kind of got the feel for what they were going for, the, the grind fest, um, and I'm just not into that. I feel like I don't know. I feel like it's insulting to my intelligence when these games want me to, you know, do these grind fests and spend all my life playing their game just so I can get a card. So, I, you know, because of the backwards compatibility now, I can go back and play Magic 13, Magic 14, Magic 2012 uh, with my friends that still that still play. And I've uh, been having a blast with that. I, went, I ran through the campaign to Magic 2014 last night, not all of it, but most of it. Um, I was playing with my brother, Chris. And uh, he was whipping my ass with these decks that he unlocked with the campaign. So I was like, oh, I got to I gotta go uh, do things. And then I went and played campaign to unlock more cards because I'm going to kick his ass. Uh, I've been playing quite a bit of Call of Duty World War II. Um, you know, that game still continues to impress me. Um, I, the game didn't get a lot of love and still doesn't get a lot of love from the Call of Duty audience. And I, and I get why. Um, uh, you know, we're I'm already feeling map fatigue, and I don't even play this game every day. Uh, and he, there's so few maps that it's just uh, kind of all starts to run together. And by the way, what the fuck, Activision? You brought in Prop Hunt, which was this badass game mode. Let, okay, hold on. Let me explain to you. Let me break it down to those of you that don't know what Prop Hunt is. And I know it's uh, been in, this isn't the first game that's had this sort of game mode, but it's the first one I've played and I had a blast. So here's Prop Hunt in Call of Duty. It's six on six. Six people are humans. Six people are props, like anything throughout the level, like a butter churn, a broom, a bike, a barrel, uh, uh, of anything, really, uh, a truck, things that are really big. Uh so what happens is for the first 30 seconds, the people that are the props have time to go ahead and hide to kind of post up somewhere in the level where they just look like they're part of the level. And uh, then after 30 seconds, the six other uh, players get unleashed and it's their job to find the props and kill them. Now, here's the catch. Here's the fun part. The props can run. And it's so much fun and it's so entertaining to be standing there and there's so much tension and anticipation because you're a barrel and this dude comes walking past you and you're just like, don't mind me, I'm just an innocent barrel. And he shoots you once and with Call of Duty, they give you flashbang grenades if you're a prop. So you can drop a flashbang grenade and run away and it just looks so funny watching this fucking barrel or a broom run across the map screaming about its innocence. Uh, man, me and my, my buddy IP Daily... 
uh, <laughs> yeah, weird name. And me, uh, IP, and Chris, we've been playing that like crazy. Then they just went and got rid of it after maybe a week or so or two. I was so bummed because I hadn't played Call of Duty in weeks. Uh, and it was, Prop Hunt did exactly what it was supposed to do. It brought me back to Call of Duty to, to be on their servers. And, you know, that's what they want. And then they took it away. Assholes. Why? Bring it back. I want it. Or I'll be sad. Moving on down. Oh, uh, wait. Have I been playing anything else? Well, I have been playing a lot more Witcher 3, but that kind of segues into our next section. I finally made the jump. Got myself an Xbox One X. Well, what happened was I got... What was it? I got the One X first. And then a couple days later, you know, once you get the One X, you got to get a 4K TV. You can't just get a One X because then you're not getting the the full experience if you're on a 1080p display. So my wife and I went out, bought a 4K TV, got the One X, set it all up. And I just wanted to give you guys some of my impressions here. So you immediately notice a difference uh, in things like snappiness of the menu. Uh, you notice load times dramatically decreased in most cases. Uh, screen quality, of course, image quality, instantly noticeable uh, depending on you know what you're playing. Uh, I think one of the first games I played on the One X was Ellie Noir, and I, that's already a uh, eight year old game, but they you know upresed it to 4K, and it it looks amazing. Um, you know, not by today's standards, not compared to you know Uncharted 4 or anything, but it looked amazing. Uh, I played through that. I played you know Call of Duty, and I the uh, what kind of led me, I guess, the impetus to me getting the TV and the Xbox one X was hearing that a Witcher three patch dropped for 4k. And I guess that just kind of pushed me and I was like, you know, time is right. Money's right. Let's do it. Um, so I've been playing a lot more Witcher three, uh, man, it looks so good. Uh, for a while in the Witcher three, you can do a performance mode, which is, um, not always 4k. It'll dynamically switch between 4k and 1080p at, but it's 60 frames solid. Or you can play in 4K mode, which is capped at 30 frames, but it's everything is a native, that's the important word, PS4 Pro, native 4K. So when I first started playing The Witcher 3 on the Xbox One X, I had it in performance mode because I just, you know, as a console player, don't get to see a lot of 60 frames per second. So it was really fun to see. I eventually... Uh, moved it over once, you know, my buddy IP daily started playing it. He, <laughs> he had, you know, keeping up with the, uh, Joneses, he got himself a one X and a 4k TV. Uh, and he, he seems to be loving it himself. So, uh, I've been playing a lot of Witcher. I recently side by sided it with the PS4 version. Um, got the PS4 on another HDMI channel. And I went to the exact same location at the same time of day in the game and just switched between channels to kind of see what the if if it was a noticeable difference because as as you play for a while you kind of start to uh, of course your eyes get used to it and it takes about a week maybe two i mean you're still impressed by the visuals don't let that stop you from getting one but it i guess the awe factor you know sort of starts to fade as as it did when we jumped to 1080p um I wanted to side by side because I just wanted to kind of reaffirm that the one X was a big jump and my God, it is, it's a huge jump. I was in, um, it doesn't matter the name of the village mid cops in the Witcher three standing outside of a, uh, like a pub and you really notice it. Like it's so obvious. You notice it in like the straw rooftops, you notice it on the mud on the floor uh, and you really notice it in the lighting quality. Uh, lighting quality takes a huge bump. Uh, so if you're kind of on the fence about, um, you know, getting a one X or jumping up to 4k and things like that, you know, I would say if the money's right, if you feel like, you know, you want to, and you could always sell your old Xbox, earn some of that money back. Like I did, uh, if, if, if the money's right and you're on the fence and you're the type of person that really values graphics over most anything else, yes, get the one X make the jump because the games that are coming out for it are only going to get better. And I haven't even started to talk about, uh, 4k ultra HD movies. Cause man, they look amazing. Uh, guardians of the galaxy two in particular looks really great. Uh, my wife and I watched fantastic beasts and where to find them in uh, 4k ultra HD looked amazing. Um, another movie that looked fantastic was it the new, uh, the new it film from 2017. So good. I need to buy that one. I rented that one. The other two we own. 
it was a fantastic movie. We're not going to get down that road just yet. Uh, last thing to say about the one X, um, you know, I really like the, uh, the boot up screen. It's a new screen that kind of, uh, it's an animation where it zooms in on the, I'm assuming is the GPU and plays, you know, a, you know, hectic sound and zooms out and it, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of stupid, but it's, I could tell that it's meant to kind of reaffirm your purchase. Like, yeah, 4k chip. Yeah. And it kind of works. So I'm cool with that. I, I, I enjoy that. I like it. Xbox one X. If you're on the fence, get it. Uh, I know Chris is probably listening to this thinking, oh, you used to be the PS4 guy. What happened? Jumping ship, Xbox beta down. Beep, 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 beep. Um, and I and I'll just say what I've always said, even when him and I would argue back on, you know, five episodes ago, ten episodes ago of the crossplay podcast, is that I'm not a PS4 guy nor an Xbox guy. I'm the guy who likes the best console. Period. Um and to me, best console means primarily number one best library exclusives um i don't care if i'm playing uh you know last of us 2 in 1080p doesn't bother me because i have no interest in gears crackdown halo games like that i guess i got a little interest in crackdown but like everyone else the the interest has completely faded as we've been dragged along by microsoft over the years saying it'll come out it'll come out it'll come out it doesn't come out um, so yeah, you know, last generation, I mean, growing up as a kid, I was an, I was the Nintendo kid. Well, mainly cause that's all we had, but I felt like those were the best consoles. I really felt like in my dumb mind that the 64 was better than the PS one. Um, uh, you know, but going back to last generation, I was a hardcore Xbox 360 guy because they had the better console. They had the better online infrastructure. You know, you don't need, they had the better controller. You don't need to hear me, you know? Uh, so, and then this generation came and Microsoft did, you know, what they've been doing the last few years and pissed off everybody at E3 with the reveal of the Xbox one, you know, the whole, it has to check in every 24 hours to be online. It, uh, you can't let friends borrow games. Uh, you, you know, there was just restriction after restriction after restriction and they pissed off the majority of gamers. Really? I, I, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think the majority of people were offended by the reveal of the Xbox one and me, you know, more so than others, because, you know, it's just my, my personality type. If I feel slighted by a company or some or a person, I'll cut them out, you know? And I kind of did that with Xbox where I was so pissed. I was like, you want to be this way? Fine. I'm jumping ship to the PlayStation. It's cheaper. It's more powerful. And it's got the better library. And you just pissed me off with your stupid ass one announcement. Um, and I kind of stayed on that because it was a good decision. The PS4, in my opinion, was better. Uh, the one thing the Xbox has over the PS4 is the controller is better uh, and the controller battery life. But other than that, upon launch, there was nothing that kept me to Xbox. Uh, I feel like I'm really rambling now, but hey, isn't that what this is for? Uh, yeah, so I guess I'm trying to bring my whole point back here. My whole point being... Uh, Chris sucks. No, I'm just kidding. My whole point is that I just like the better console. Last generation, Microsoft had the better console. From 2013 to 2017, for five years, PlayStation had the better console. Sony did. And now we're back with the One X. Is The One X is markedly better than the PS4 Pro. And that's how you know I'm not a fanboy, because I'm not afraid to say that. It's just objectively looking at facts. You know who adamantly argues that they're not a fanboy? Fanboys. <laughs> I'm hurting my own case <laughs> so bad. Uh, so anyways, let's move on now down the list to some news. Late breaking news. Nintendo Labo. What the fuck? Have you heard of Nintendo Labo? It's this new, uh, it's like a toy. It's a, it's a game, but it uses the joy cons on the switch and it comes with a bunch of cardboard that you can kind of pop out and, and fold into different like shapes, like a piano or a robot, or a grasshopper, or any of these weird, weird-ass things. Like, you can create a cardboard piano, and you use the, the Joy-Con controllers off the Switch uh, to kind of play it. You put the Joy-Con controllers on either side of the piano. It's like, in, you know, an 8-inch piano. It's not very long. And uh, the you, when you press a key, the cardboard interrupts the motion sensor on the uh, Joy-Con controller, 
And that's how it tries to tell what note you're playing by how far away from the Joy-Con the sensor is being interrupted. So that's how it knows what notes to play. It's, man, it's so weird. Weird Nintendo is best Nintendo. That's hands down. Anytime Nintendo gets weird, go look at some of their old, or older Japanese commercials, uh, especially one for like the Game Boy camera. <laughs> A lot of weird commercials. Uh, weird Nintendo is best Nintendo. When they make, that's why I love them. They take risks. Sony doesn't take a lot of huge risks. PS4, I mean, um, PSVR was not a huge risk because it VR was already a known quantity. People wanted it. Um, Xbox definitely doesn't take risks uh, just because they've just played safe. That's how they are. Uh, Nintendo, on the other hand, going all the way back to the N64, they take huge risks. Uh, with that controller, with the attempted uh, double D dolphin disk drive, whatever it was called, for the uh, 64. For the Wii, when they jumped into motion sensing, that was really n weird at the time. And now look at um, everyone else jumping on board with it. Connect uh, jumped on board. Uh, micro or Sony jumped on board with a six axis controller. Uh, Nintendo always innovates when they get weird. And so it's really cool to see where Labo's going to go. I believe. So here, here's the hitch with Labo. I believe the the game with the cardboard is like 90 bucks. And let's not forget, this is cardboard. A kid's toy made of cardboard. How long do you think this $90 piece of cardboard is going to last a 10-year-old? You know, not very long. However, Nintendo knows that. And to remedy that, what they're doing is making the printable versions of the cardboard available like online just to print on your own. So that's pretty cool. Um, I think it's going to, I'm predicting it to be, uh, how do you measure success? I, 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 when I say I think it's going to be successful, I think it's going to sell well enough to justify its existence. I think it's going to maybe even leave a bit of a mark on the toy industry. Uh, is it going to take the world by storm? No, I definitely don't think so. However, I kind of would love to see it. Imagine what you could expand the Labo library to. Um, if you just keep thinking and innovating different things, you could build out of cardboard and, and interact with the joy con. It could be a really, uh, booming industry for Nintendo. If it catches, uh, we'll see it's, you know, time will tell red dead redemption Two delayed yet again. Damn you rockstar for real though. I think we all could have seen this coming red dead redemption two has been delayed yet again. There are a few things in life that are certain death. Taxes and Rockstar delaying games. It happens every single time. However, to be honest with you, I really did not think they were going to delay it ag again. This is the second delay. Again, that's still not quite, uh, you know, out of uh, context or out of character, rather, for what Rockstar has done. Um, they posted in a blog on their website, quote, We apologize to everyone disappointed by this delay. While we had hoped to have the game out sooner, we require a little extra time for polish. Um, yeah, delayed it for the second time. It was expected this spring. It is now set for an October 26th release. Um, man, I really thought they were going to release in spring. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Red Dead released in spring or was it September? I'm going to look it up right here. Um, yeah, so that, let's see, May 18th. Yeah. So it was in the spring. Um, yeah, I was really bummed to hear that, but you know, it goes back to the old, uh, uh, the old adage that a, a, a game delay is temporary. A bad game is permanent. So, you know, I, I trust rockstar. They know what they're doing. It's, but it's still disappointing news. Um, I'm going to be picking up Red Dead day one. I rarely, rare, very rarely pre-order games anymore. I've been burned too many times. Um, I stopped just short of saying you should never pre-order games. Uh, just because I don't want to be too much of a hypocrite, there are certain games I will pre-order every year. I will pre-order WWE 2K every year. I will pre-order uh, MLB The Show uh, every year. And I will pre-order any Bethesda game Um and I will pre-order this. <laughs> Certain big games uh, just have to be pre-ordered. Uh, so I will I will be right on top of that. Let's move right down the list here. Speaking of do not pre-order, Star Wars Battlefront 2 has failed to meet sales expectations. 
So, seven million. That's the number of Star Wars Battlefront Two copies sold during the holiday quarter. One million less than Electronic Arts had expected, as revealed during the company's quarterly earnings this past Tuesday. So you think, hey, that's cool. Like, it worked. The whole no, don't pre-order the whole boycott Battlefront Two. It worked, right? Uh, no, false. Uh, the Empire, I mean EA, is still their stock is still rising. Um, one hundred and thirty-one dollars and one cent was their share price at one point this past Wednesday, which is a new all-time high for the publisher. So, while Battlefront Two itself didn't uh, sell as many copies as expected, it doesn't matter. Uh, you didn't win <laughs> game development or game e- gaming community that's uh, out crying at this Battlefront 2 uh, loot crate fiasco. You lost. Uh, basically because, yeah, they didn't sell as many units, but their stock price is at an all-time high. Uh, so that's all that matters to them is the stockholders. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, I played through Battlefront 2. I didn't purchase it. I received it for free. Um it was fine it was it was fun it was a cool game i never booted up still uh which should tell you a lot i played maybe six to eight hours of multiplayer i played the campaign um it's a good game not great uh you know star wars what do you (laughs) what do you expect uh so kind of sad disheartening news on the front of the big evil empire i mean ea uh trying to squash all of our wallets and and pound us into poverty with their shitty games <laughs> moving on down the list. Now Kaz Harai has stepped down. Uh, you, if you are, a, if you are a PlayStation fanboy, you would know that Kaz Harai is the CEO president and CEO of Sony. Uh, I'm going to read you a little bit of this article here from polygon.com written by Michael McWhirtor. That's not a real name. Kazuo Kai's Harai will leave his role as president and CEO of Sony on April 1st, the company announced today. Sony Corporation named Kenichiro Yoshida, currently executive deputy president of chief and chief financial officer at the company, as his replacement. Harai will continue to serve at Sony as a chairman and sit on the board of directors. Harai explained his decision to pass the baton to Yoshida in a lengthy statement released by Sony. Uh, let me see if how long this is. Yeah, this is a couple paragraphs. I'm going to s- squeeze through this and we'll move on. So this is Kaz Harai given his reason for his uh, departure. Quote, ever since my appointment as president and CEO in April 2012, I have stated that my mission is to ensure Sony continues to be a company that provides customers with kando, which means to move them emotionally and inspires them and fulfills their curiosity. To this end, I have dedicated myself to transforming the company and enhancing its profitability, and I'm very proud that now, in the third and final year of our current mid-range corporate plan, we are expecting to exceed our financial targets. And it excites me to hear more and more people enthuse that Sony is back again. As the company approaches a crucial juncture, when we will embark on a new mid-range plan, I consider this to be the ideal time to pass the baton of leadership to new management for the future of Sony and also myself to embark on a new chapter in my life. My successor, Kenichiro Yoshida, has supported me closely since returning to Sony in December 2013, contributing extensively beyond his remit as CFO and acting as valuable confidant and business partner as we took on the challenging, oh, the challenge of transforming Sony together. Mr. Yoshida combines a deeply strategic mindset with a relentless determination to achieve defined targets and the ability to make a global viewpoint or take a global viewpoint, excuse me. I believe he possesses the breadth of experience and perspective, as well as an unwavering leadership qualities required to manage Sony's diverse array of businesses. And as such is the ideal person to drive the company forward into the future. As chairman, I will of course offer my full support to Mr. Yoshida and the new management team and do all I can to facilitate a smooth transition to ensure their future success. So, Harai, he's 57 years old. He's stepping down. It kind of seems like he's uh, he's just kind of like, I've done all I can. You know, I came in. I had a vision. Uh, I met that vision. I exceeded it. And I'm leaving this company better than when I found it. And it's time to go. Uh, and that's that's cool, man. I'm glad, you know, he didn't work till he died. Uh, like um, Iw- Iwata, the, the Nintendo guy. I'm glad he didn't, you know, have some scandal or be fired like Kojima. 
he got to leave on his own terms. He came, he saw, he conquered, he's out. It sounds like he uh, has full confidence in Mr. Yoshida to take care of it. Um, so yeah, good news. Um, I think it's kind of uh, it's kind of bittersweet, you know, to see him go. He's been at every press conference. You know, you're used to seeing him at the E3. Uh, he's always had a really good sense of humor. He's always um, he's got that. Well, not it's not ran by him. A fan runs a a parody Twitter account uh, that just it's supposed to be Kaz Harai. Just you know, it's a parody, so it's him just saying stupid shit. <laughs> the the Twitter account will continue to live on. For those of you, I wish I had the fake Twitter account on me right now, but I don't. Um, yeah, Mr. Kazurai, we will miss you. Moving on down the list. Uh, so there's a lot of big news this week. A lot of rumblings earlier this week about uh, Games Pass will be getting first party games for free. That's pretty rad if you're a Games Pass guy or gal. Um, see, you you might be noticing a lack of excitement in my voice. And that comes from a lack of excitement. <laughs> uh, the reason being is, okay, so Games Pass is getting first party games. So what? Cool. What first party games are coming? We got Sea of Thieves, State of Decay 2, Crackdown 3, and Ori and the Will of the Wisps. That is the entire exclusive calendar for this next year. So it's not very much to be excited about. I didn't really even have plans to play Sea of Thieves. Um, I've been hearing good things, but I'm just not sure if it's something I am interested in. Uh, State of Decay 2, definitely not a uh, Games Pass seller. Uh, not worth buying Games Pass for. Um, I haven't played it, but I played State of Decay 1, and while it was a fun game, it was a very good game even, it's not a console seller. It's not a Games Pass seller. It's nothing nothing to pay $120 a year for, which you would be doing if you had Games Pass. Uh, Crackdown 3. St I, st <laughs> I still don't believe Crackdown 3 is coming out. I've been saying this for almost a year. Crackdown 3 is not real, and we will never see it. It's it's a myth. It's like it's like the Tooth Fairy or North Dakota. It'll never be. So some indie game store owners seem to be pretty unhappy. Uh, here's a quote for you. Uh, quote, essentially, it's made our Xbox business worthless overnight. Effectively, overnight, they've wiped massive value off of our company and made it not worth doing. Why should we support them and sell their consoles and accessories if we're going to get very little out of it? We don't make anything off their digital selection. It's pretty pointless. We might as well go the, go where we're supported, which is Sony. Um, so like many independent game retailers, uh, this guy, Stuart Benson of, I'm not going to pronounce this right, uh, Leicestershire, Le Le Leicestershire, Leicestershire. Uh, he, ha he has an independent game store in, <laughs> called, in, in the Shire called Extreme Games. And he's not really a fan of Microsoft, including first party titles in the Games Pass. So some probably a pretty, pretty small minority um, people are pretty upset. Uh, I personally don't see the value um, in getting Games Pass if this is all we're getting in a year. Um, Microsoft's exclusives have never been their strong point. Uh, I mean, they have, but not within the last not this generation. Their exclusives have pushed not very many consoles. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to sit back and see that, you know, the, the silver lining to this, let me not be so negative the whole time. The silver lining is if you were going to play crackdown three, if you were going to play state of decay or sea of thieves, you can sign up for games pass and basically get those games for free because games pass is going to cost you $120 a year. These games are $60 each. So you take sea of thieves and crackdown three hundred and twenty dollars and he put it towards Game Pass instead, and you get everything else with that's included with Game Pass for free, essentially. That's a hell of a deal, and that's good. If, you know, the money's there for you, and if you have an interest in Crackdown 3, which I don't think exists, or State of Decay 2 or Sea of Thieves, or Ori and the Will of the Wisps, then yeah, cool, go for it. Um, I don't think this is a bad move, of course. I think Games Pass has only been getting better. 
Uh, I think they're stomping Sony in terms of the backwards catalog collection because of the backwards compatibility and because PlayStation now sucks. There's always lag, no matter what. No matter how good your connection is, there's always lag when you're streaming. So playing a timing-intensive game like uh, God of War or a shooter is uh, is a no-go on PlayStation now. Uh, so I just I only see Xbox Games Pass getting better and better. But this uh, particular news doesn't excite me as much as they would like it to. Let's move right along now. So, as you may have noticed, I missed the turn from 2017 into 2018, and with that, I missed some uh, pretty like pretty fun end-of-the-year stuff that I wanted to get to. Uh, for instance, I didn't get to do a top 10, so that's what I'm going to do right now for you guys. I'm going to break down my top 10 games of 20. 17 now keep in mind these are only top 10 games of which i played so you're not going to see some games in here that you might think would be on this list or maybe even be number one such as super mario odyssey um legend of zelda breath of the wild didn't play wolfenstein 2 uh this is so this is purely based on the games i played so let's get right into my top 10 video games of 2017 Coming in at number 10, we got Fortnite. What a fun game. Um, they kind of uh, they kind of capitalized on, what's the name, Blue Hole? The name of the company that does um, PUBG. Uh, they kind of capitalized on their laziness. Um, they're kind of resting on their laurels over there. And Fortnite was like, okay, well, we can do it. And we can do it better. Uh, we could do it, make it run better. And we could do it for free. Um now, some people might argue about that first point, whether or not it's better, but it is different. It's more of a cartoony style. I do wish there were vehicles in it, but there's not. Uh, but, you know, for not wanting to spend the money on the glitchy, buggy, pre-alpha mess that Fortnite is, uh, getting, I mean, I'm sorry, that Player Unknown's Battleground is, getting Fortnite for free? Hell yeah, number 10. Coming in at number 9, South Park, The Fractured Butthole. Uh Cool game, man. I loved it. Uh, there were some really funny scenes. Here's my 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 hitch with this game. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I played because you know when you pre-ordered it, you would get South Park: The Stick of Truth for free. So I pre-ordered it about a month before Fractured But Whole came out. So in the month leading up to it, I just marathoned through uh, the Stick of Truth. Which was good because what a freaking awesome game it is, but it was kind of it kind of worked against me because in the end I was kind of South Parked out by the time, uh, you know, like by the time I got to the fractured but whole, I was kind of over playing South Park for a while, but I still kind of didn't force is not, not the right word, but I didn't play it as feverishly as I would newer games. Um, I don't think it was as good as the Stick of Truth. I think the combat was better, which is a huge deal. But I don't think the story itself and the laughs were as good as the Stick of Truth. Uh, but still, uh, very true to the South Park formula. The laughs were there. Uh, if you're a fan of the Stick of Truth, or if you're a fan of turn-based RPGs, period, give it a shot. Uh, it was my number nine game of 2017. Coming in at number eight, Injustice 2. Uh, not a whole lot to really say, though. Uh, it's such a solid game. I mean, what other game can you make uh, the Ninja Turtles fight Hellboy? Uh, in full 1080p 60 frames looks awesome um they just they really put out a great game with injustice it kind of got overshadowed by mortal kombat x um and then injustice 2 they just kind of built on it. it's exactly what you want out of a sequel they built on all the good parts took out some of the bad parts um damn <laughs> it's funny i started saying this saying i don't have much to say but now that i'm talking about it, i really want to play it uh really great game if you're looking for an, an alternative to uh, you know, other games like Tekken or Mortal Kombat X, check out Injustice 2. Uh, while Tekken was a great game, it just doesn't stack up uh, technically to Injustice 2. And I love me some Batman. So coming in at number seven, we have Call of Duty World War II. Uh, this is the game that brought me back to Call of Duty. Um, I came in on the franchise in uh, Modern Warfare 2. Played Modern Warfare 2, played Black Ops, uh, you know, played played them up until Ghost. I played Black Ops 2, 
uh, when the next gen came out and Call of Duty Ghost came out, I kind of jumped off. I they I could tell they were kind of going full tilt with it. Uh, now we're running on walls. Now we're you know it, attacks are coming from everywhere. There's jetpacks and it was just not why. If I want that, I'll play Halo. In fact, that's why I played Call of Duty to begin with because I didn't want that shit. I didn't want to play Halo. Um, they finally brought it back to here's your uh, buzz phrase: boots on the ground gameplay. And it's all I asked for. That's all I wanted for years. Just bring it back to no more fucking wall running. Um, bring it back to World War One or World War Two or even the modern day. And, um, you know, after seeing the success of Battlefield 1 from EA, they did just that and brought it to uh, World War Two. Now, I still think, and, and this is my prediction, this year at E3, EA will announce a World War Two Battlefield. Guarantee it. Battlefield 5 is going to be World War Two. Um. Hold me to that over on Twitter at Crossplay Pod. When that announcement happens, come give me my brownie points. Uh, so Call of Duty World War II at number seven. What a fun game. I have a blast with the multiplayer. Prop Hunt, the new game mode that they fucking robbed me of, is so fun. So much enjoyment playing. I'm, me and IP and Chris were laughing so hard. Uh, so Call of Duty World War II, number seven on my top ten. Moving on down the list to number six, we have Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh I kind of feel like this game's been uh, came at a bad time for me and, and kind of went underappreciated. Um, you know, it, it, 2017 was a great year. There were so many good games uh, coming in from left, right, center. So some games fell through the cracks. And not only was Assassin's Creed Origins kind of a victim of that for me, it was also hampered by the fact that about two months after getting it, I got the 1X. So, of course, I'm giving the 1X a lot of attention. Um but I do recognize the scope and scale and the technical achievement uh, put on by Ubisoft here. Um, finally, an Assassin's Creed game where I'm not cussing and yelling at my TV because this stupid-ass idiot just runs into a wall instead of climbing it. You can climb anything in this game. Uh, they really fixed... It's almost perfect. They fixed almost everything. Uh, but sometimes the scope and scale of the game can be a little daunting and uh, kind of make you not want to play for the same reason you might not want to play the witcher because you just don't want to get that deep into something uh, but still it's a great game i know i'm going to finish it i'm going to get back to it uh number six coming in at number five now this is where you can tell it's one of my lists because no one's going to put this on their top 10 wwe 2k 18 who doggy talk about one x enhanced uh that game just got a one x enhancement about a month ago uh, in, uh, January, that's the month. And, <laughs> uh, it, and so running it, I have it on PlayStation four and Xbox one. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm that much of a fan. Now the eight man matches on PS4, the frames would suffer pretty noticeably. Like it would drop down to maybe 15 to 20 frames per second in eight man matches while still playable. It was noticeable. Oh shit, man. Going to Xbox one X, do an eight man match. Shit runs like butter. It's so awesome. Uh, it kind of got me back into universe mode, um, which, you know, is they're slightly improving on it every year. There's still, you know, guys, listen, listen, here, come here, come, come sit on old Uncle Nicky James's lap. You sit there and say you want no mercy. You sit there and say you want WrestleMania 2000. No, you don't. That is nostalgia talking. Almost everything is better now in WWE games. Uh, the graphics, the storytelling, the rosters, the match types, the uh, mechanics. You know, the only thing that's just not there is that, that fun factor that was there in the older games. They're more of a sim. See, I think that's where the problem lies is they're treating it like a sim, like you would treat MLB The Show or NBA 2K18. When you can't because it's wrestling, it's meant to be fun and arcadey. Um but, you know, that's the route they're going. But I've still had a blast with this game. Every year has been better than the last uh, since this gen. 2K15 was bad, uh, but at the time I didn't know any better, so I still enjoyed it. 2K16 was a little better. Uh, still not very good, though. Uh, 2K17 was pretty damn good. They really were making a lot of improvements. And this year, again, it's just really gradual. Um, you know, me and Chris talked about this before on the podcast where what else can you do? There's only so much you could do. You can only reach a certain level of realism and roster size and match types. And there's only so much innovation you could put into a wrestling game. Um, 
and and when it comes to WWE and, and professional wrestling in general, I'm very nostalgic about it. So I'm already predisposed to like it, uh, the game. And if it's not good, I'll still like it. It's got to be really, really shit for me to not like it. Uh, so yeah, that's my number five, WWE 2K18. Get some. Coming in at number four, we have Resident Evil 7. That game is so awesome. Um, I played it last year and uh shoot man just had a blast just kind of trudge not trudge trudge is the wrong word makes it sound like i don't like it i just kind of powered through and that's the wrong word too shit i kind of suffered ah, damn it no resident evil 7 very fun game uh played through it in about four days uh the only kind of a uh, nick against it is that it's not really a game you're going to go back and play a lot I maybe mean, you might go back and play it once after some time has passed but it's not really your uh you know your yearly game uh, or a game you're going to play three times because it was so deep and there's, you know, hidden Easter eggs and shit. Um, but it was a great one-time experience. It, the Resident Evil series is back. They're back to their roots. Uh, yeah, it's probably the best Resident Evil game I've played. Um, it's up there with Resident Evil 4. So moving on down the list here, getting to the top three. What are my top three games of the year? I will tell you. Coming in at number three, we've got Cuphead. Oh, baby. I've been wanting Cuphead since the day it debuted at like E3 2013 or something. Um, you know, it's, it's it's what I what I game for. It's what it's what I gamed for in my childhood. Just platforming uh, difficulty, learning the bosses patterns. And, and but then is that added an element of the co-op that just works? I, I don't think I've ever played that game single player. Actually, I've only ever played uh, co-op because that's what I feel like the games. I feel like the game's meant to be played that way. Uh, I love the art style, the 1930s cartoon style. I love the, the the jazz music as rudimentary as it is. It's still really nice. Good toe-tapping music. Um, haven't beat it yet, but I think I will one day, and that's kind of the, the cool thing about it. Um, and the cool thing about the next game on this list, number two, is that you're not going to beat it in one sitting or two sittings or ten sittings. It's a game that I'll come back to next year and still try to chip away at it. So Cuphead, I can't really think of anything they did wrong like i'm trying to think of something you know i can you know ding it for but maybe the difficulty drives some people away um but it's that's why i bought it was for the difficulty um yeah so cuphead number three coming in at number two sonic mania dude leave it to somebody not named sega to make sonic great again the last few sonic games and the sonic game that has come since there's been one sonic forces garbage they're all shit i don't know what they're wh why do they ki keep trying to fit this square peg into a circular hole like sonic is 2d sonic is speed sonic is platforming why do you keep fucking putting him in these games where he's trying to save a princess from zircania and you know he's got to kiss her on the lips there's a kissing scene in sonic 06 i think or whatever sonic crystal shard fuckery stop doing that man <laughs> just make sonic 2d fast make him have sass and i'll buy that shit sonic mania was a great sonic game made by the people that don't make sonic uh and it's probably going to be on my top 10 list of the decade because it's such a good game um so yeah I, as you can see i'm kind of passionate about that now number one my top game, my favorite game, the best game of 2017. Can you guess it? It's Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah, duh. Obviously, Horizon Zero Dawn just trumps these games. I would, I, having not played Wind Waker, I mean, Wind Waker, I've played Wind Waker, having not played. Breath of the Wild, and having not played Mario Galaxy, I still don't think if I played those, they would take Horizon away as the number one spot. Uh, Aloy, I fell in love with Aloy, the character. Um, while while a little shallow, she's not as shallow as, say, like Kratos <laughs> or someone. Uh, just the the combat mechanics in that game, the, the premise of the ancient mechanical beast coming to life, the, the premise was awesome. It was a story that was expertly told expertly executed um and i i i remember sitting there a few days into it climbing on top of a giant dinosaur 
machine so I can get a lay of the land. I remember thinking and almost saying out loud to myself, this is a franchise. I will be playing Horizon in 10 years. Uh, you know, Horizon 2 or 3 or 4. Hopefully not Horizon 2 comes out in 10 years. But, you know, I can tell this is going to be like the next Uncharted or the next Tomb Raider for Sony. It's going to be a huge franchise that's going to make them billions if they keep treating it right. And it was really cool to see Guerrilla Games go from making a game I would do anything to stay away from, like Killzone, I never liked the franchise, to completely doing a 180 and making Horizon Zero Dawn. I commend them immensely for that. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, if you have not played it, you're doing yourself a disservice. The Frozen Wilds DLC just came out a few months ago. I haven't played it, but I hear it's amazing. Uh, get out there. Go play Horizon Zero Dawn. So to Fortnite, South Park, Injustice, Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed, WWE, Resident Evil, Cuphead, Sonic Mania, and Horizon, I thank you. Those were awesome games. Let's move on. It is time for the very last segment of today's Crossplay Podcast. Everyone's favorite, entitled Forgotten Game of the Week. Let's get right into it. Today's Forgotten Game of the Week is Snowboard Kids 2 for the Nintendo 64. Did you play Snowboard Kids 2? Let me know what you thought over on Twitter at Crossplay Pod. Let's have a little conversation about it. So what was... Okay, for, for one... What was up with the 90s and snowboarding games? Holy shit, they were all over the place in the 90s. Sean White had one. Uh, there was 1080, 1080p. There was 1080 snowboarding. There was this. There was SSX Tricky. There was a lot of them. Um, I think that it was like the X Games like craze of the 90s, the extreme sports craze of the 90s that kind of gave birth to uh, this game and games like it. So Mario Kart is old news. Diddy Kong has not aged very well. So what do you do in this conundrum? You give snowboard kids a pop. So it never really matched, um, you know, sales in terms of Mario Kart or Diddy Kong Racing, but its colorful course and like Pinocchio style characters really gave it a cult following, including me. Me and my brothers used to play this game nonstop when we were kids. I mean, not it wasn't like our everyday game, but when we had it, we played it a lot. It was even a game I remember playing on my own sometimes, just, you know, when they were gone. Um, it was just really colorful. Um, you know, the races could be turned on their head with like a single well-timed shot. They had weapons just like in Mario Kart. Uh, the weapons were usually, there was always one right after the, the starting line. Um, you know, so while the ability to jump over traps and like earn speed boosts by doing tricks added even more layers so there was like speed boost you could do tricks and you could shoot each other so it was really kind of an amalgamation of like twisted metal diddy kong and mario kart all in one place uh the sequel uh snowboard kids 2 the one we're talking about here it had uh pretty improved graphics uh tighter turning controls in the original it had a better world design than in uh, diddy kong racing in my opinion and the tracks that had you skimming across sand and grass and snow were really kind of a cool add-in like as an adult I, I look back and i was watching these levels and i was like if i was an adult and i saw that i'd be like oh it's snowboard kids why are we on dirt but you know kid you're less you're less cynical i loved it so they, they take it off course they kind of had to justify a sequel can't just be all snow so you're racing in sand dunes you're racing uh down hills and things like that uh, it was really um, some really appreciated uh, layers added to the gameplay. So the sequel uh, didn't really sell as well uh, as other games around the time. That's why I'm putting it as a forgotten game. It didn't really top any charts that year. But I know it was fun and I know it holds up because I just played it yesterday. Uh, yeah, such a fun game. Go check it out. You got your characters all from the first one. Uh, there's the fat kid. There's the cool kid who suddenly turned black in this one uh there's the girl who got a bigger nose and <laughs> snowboard kids do is just really uh fun childlike like whimsy it's very 90s in a nutshell uh colorful um the music is also pretty unforgettable you could probably hear it in the background here so if you have an emulator if you have a 64 lane around maybe go to a swap meet a flea market and you find e even snowboard kids one the original is good snowboard kids two is a little better snowboard kids one will suffice so check out snowboard kids 2 
if you haven't. Great game. If you have a suggestion for a forgotten game of the week for next week, send it on over to Crossplay Pod on Twitter. And if you got any questions, concerns, comments, you just want to tell me I suck, send it over to Crossplay at Crossplay Pod on Twitter. And before I go, before I end the show, I want to remind you guys once again of our all new wrestling centric YouTube channel called Stiff Receipt. You might be asking yourself, what is what does stiff receipt mean? What is a stiff receipt? Let me explain it. Maybe I should explain it on the channel one day too. A stiff receipt in in pro wrestling is when you hit somebody really hard because they hit you. Um, in pro wrestling, a lot of the punches and stuff are pulled. You're not really hitting the guy, or if you do hit him, you're hitting him really gently. If you were to accidentally or intentionally uh, hit a guy really hard, which in wrestling is called stiffing, if you stiff someone, you hit them hard, you're going to get what's called a receipt, which basically just means you're going to get hit back. So in wrestling, a stiff receipt is when you hit someone hard, either intentionally or on accident, and they not only do they give you a receipt by hitting you back hard, uh, you know, for real, they hit you back hard. So that's what we're named after. We are hard hitting opinion, news and commentary. So come join us. Go subscribe to the all new YouTube channel, Stiff Receipt. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Like I said, you can find us over on Twitter at Crossplay Pod. You can find us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash crossplay. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. We will see you next week. The Crossplay Podcast marches on. Bye-bye.